Welcome to the lecturette, Arts and Media. In this lecturette, we will evaluate the very definition of art and recompose its definition into more fundamental terms for expression. We will review what it is about the subject of art and media that anthropologists find most relevant to their own research and find ways in which art and media have proven themselves to be a durable means for providing the narratives for social change and the public text of inner expression. We will also evaluate what makes art authentic and who is in charge of this authentication process. Finally, we will consider citizens' media today, my field, the media of everyday people asking the question, how can we evaluate reportage derived from an omnivocal world? Our specific learning objectives for this lecture at part one, art and text reading will be to examine what art is in general, fundamental terms, to review what is unique about how anthropologists study art, to analyze the relationship between art and power in the inhabited world. We have some key words. We also have some key concepts that won't be defined in the glossary, including citizens' media, which is basically the kind of media that everyday people use all over the world, usually uh, for advocacy purposes, but also mediation. Now, the reason I put that word in is because media for an anthropologist is really cast very broadly, this word media, and really it comes from the word mediation, meaning any sort of media that's put in between two people. What is the, what is the electronic or the platform or the, or the written text? What is it that goes in between people as that communication form? This for us is really the basis of media. For this topic, we will examine the anthropological study of art and media. Art and artistic expression are deeply entwined with cultural systems of meaning. They are thus of extreme interest to anthropologists. The anthropology, anthropological study of art is different from other disciplines, such as fine arts and art history. Anthropologists are primarily interested in the cultural impact of art rather than its aesthetic or historical significance. Anthropologists who study visual art and communications are known as visual anthropologists, and those who study more of the linguistic communication side of this field, this subfield, are known as media anthropologists like myself, a little bit more all-encompassing. And what may surprise you about the subdisciplines or these subdisciplines is that the visual anthropologists, visual anthropology has a history of being on the cutting edge of democratizing representation of the world's diversity of people. Just to give you a quick preview, in 1895, for instance, the Lumiere brothers at the dawn of filmmaking were making ethnographic films of people coming out of a factory, for instance. So there are two parallel trajectories going on in the first days of filmmaking. One is the Edison kind of view of filmmaking, which is to show people in a drama or in an act. And the other vein in filmmaking at that time is showing people in real life. These later, are, these later two genres are basically known as feature films, dramatic feature films rather, and the other one are documentary films. Now just to tell you really quickly, quick history, documentary, that word documentary actually came from, third, th uh, came from an early ethnographic film. Th ethnographic films have been going on and being made for 30 years before that word came about and it was defined in a documentary film that was uh, made about um, the Polynesian people. So uh, ethnographic filmmaking has been there since the very beginning on the cutting edge and always producing new and innovative ways of representing the world's diversity of people. Let me tell you about uh, a quick reproduction of a city very interesting, Maureen Ho is a famous miniature reconstruction of the city of Rio de Janeiro. From the perspective of artistic techniques, this piece is quite simple. The buildings are built out of old and discarded bricks, tiles, mortar, and so on. Essentially, anyone could scrounge up anything to make this uh, building. The streets of the miniature city are full of people, but again, the people are represented by anything from bottle caps to batteries. The artists are also not trained or particularly skilled or well-known. Instead, the entire model was the construction of neighborhood children. But this model says a lot to an anthropologist. How do people on the lower economic scale represent their society, their own culture? 
In this, uh, in this uh, lecture, we're going to do something different too. We're going to show whole slides for the art and the, some of the media we have. Here's Maureen Hall with, uh, oh, but that's really interesting. They've got some place names out there for you. So obviously people are putting the, the significance of what they find there in their own neighborhood, right? So they have Calan and Matuete, the places they go to and curl. Maybe that's even one person's house. They go Carmen here, here a little bit different color. Uh, so yeah, we do carefully look at this and kind of analyze this. This is how they're representing the world here in these favelas. Two things I think can be really highlighted by Morinho. I mean, the model was started as a game by two brothers, so it was started on low scale. They acted out scenes or friendship or gang violence in the streets, and they made the entire project a neighborhood collective activity. What's uh, one of the more important things, though, since it's constructed, Maureen has attracted international attention from many groups. So it's brought attention to the plight of the favelas and the favela children here uh, and made people interested internationally in, in this uh, kind of art exhibit, as it were, going from po popular, basically, uh, art made from garbage into maybe some more of like a high art uh, examination. Uh, of what's going on. Anthropologists are particularly interested in Marino for its cultural effect too. The city model was built in one of the favelas and attention was raised by Marino who has resulted in a great deal of positive activity for the community. And that's the other thing that's significant about Marino, about public art uh, and pop art. Sometimes it could bring a lot of uh, beneficial attention to uh, social issues. For anthropologists then who are, are holistic thinkers, right? Anthropologists define art in the broadest of all forms as the ideas, forms, techniques, and strategies that humans employ to express themselves creatively and to communicate their creativity and inspiration to others. Now you can imagine we pretty much consider any expression from a human being art, and as well as it should be, because it's coming from the inner psyche of people, right? It's, it's a, coming from an inner voice. So this definition would incorporate may, many things, maybe even things you would normally consider art. Anthropologists are interested in any creative expression. As we can see, that expression is a window into a cultural worldview, and that's the important thing. Here I'd like you to pause the video and put on this YouTube video, Gangnam Style from the Gangnam District of Seoul, South Korea, and please dance. No, I'm just kidding. No, this is a really uh, a, a silly uh, pop, uh, catchy tune, of course, but you don't get three billion views on YouTube unless there's something else going on. And this is a really catchy video because he's basically making fun of the style of Beverly Hills, this particular district right here, Gangnam, Gangnam District in South Korea. So it's a clever parody of this area as well as a catchy tune. And this is why uh, pop art has to sometimes have this edge in order to put it over into really phenomenal uh, popularity as this does. When we start to parse out the differences between fine art and popular art, it really is a consideration of aesthetics. Now aesthetics and the aesthetic experience have to do with how we perceive art. Many Westerners have embraced a notion of the universal aesthetic. That is to say that humans around the world share an aesthetic sense. This argument suggests, suggests we are all, generally speaking, we all find the same things attractive and same things repulsive. This view derives in part from the Western philosophers Immanuel Kant and George Hegel. Kant and Hegel specifically argue that nature creates a universal aesthetic among human beings. Now, we're all good cultural relativists now. And I have to tell you that in the ancient times when the Maya saw a, a rainbow, they were afraid. They, were, they would think that the, the god of thunder was about to bring down a he hell and heaven on earth. And so their perception of what we think of the universal beauty of a rainbow is not necessarily universal. So these shared experiences result in a shared aesthetic, but they're not universal in a sense. Anthropologists oppose the concept of uni the universal aesthetic. They favor the notion that our aesthetic sense is culturally based. And we have good evidence for that, of course. 
Uh, as you certainly are aware at this point, culture is very worldwide and our culture no notably affects the way in which we see and interpret the world around us. Ultimately, our anthropologists argue that aesthetics re represent an interpretive act. We look at a piece of art, watch a performance, and we interpret that performance based on our own experience, culture, and intellect. This is one of the first impressionistic paintings ever done by Claude Monet. As a matter of fact, that is, this is where the name Impressionism came from because the name of this painting is Impression Sunrise, the painting that gave its name to the style and artistic movement. Now, when, it, when Impressionism first came out, it was considered unfinished art, almost childish, right? A popular kind of art style that would probably fade. Now I think there's no question that this has reached the fine art pantheon. Let me give you an example of folk art that I would consider high art. Now these masks right here made by the Kwa Waka Waku, when Franz Boas looked at him, it convinced him that, there, that the mind of primitive man, so-called primitive man, wasn't so primitive. That the complex expression, abstraction going on in these pieces rivaled Picasso in that, you know, or preempted Picasso's style of ab abstract expressionism. This was really serious, complicated art. One important fact that anthropologists realize too is that there is the art of put on a pedestal and collected and the art that people actually use. Now we all use and practice uh, our artistic expression in our everyday lives and cultures around the world and into the past. Creative expression though is part of daily life. And buildings may be painted or decorated, but these buildings are lived and visited and otherwise used. So this is a far cry from museum or from a museum gallery where one is supposed to go and look at uh, a piece of art out of context. Elaborate clothing was made to be worn and the same is true for headdresses. How can you understand a headdress unless you actually see what the signific significance of the feathers and of the materials are? So there's a big difference between art uh, on the pedestal and art used around the world in everyday wear. We all know that Art goes uh, back a long way in cultural human history, 30,000, 40,000 years ago. We have the cave painting to prove it. But recently, new artifacts have come out of the Blombos Cave in uh, South Africa overlooking the Indian Ocean. And archaeologist Christopher Henselwood and his colleagues have, have recovered blocks of red ochre with symbols carved into them and what appears to be a painter's toolkit. This includes bone tools for mixing paint, stones for grinding mineral pigments. We can't say for certain what was being painted, but varying types of paint, uh, a body paint is likely the answer. Dating in archeology span can be problematic, but these artistic tools likely date back to 100,000 years ago. 100,000 years ago, we had a painter's palette. That's pretty amazing. Here are some of the famous cave paintings from the art of Lascaux Cave in France. What's interesting, I think, about these, there's some new data that suggests, for instance, that humans over here wearing now deer antler headdresses before 15 years ago, archaeologists speculated that uh, they were doing shamanistic, they were painting shamanistic rites, basically, and that these caves were used for some shamanistic experience. But you know what? Archaeologists don't really hunt very often. And it, leave it up to the Native American anthropologists to point out, like myself, that, hey, uh, these headdresses are actually used in hunting. So we've kind of reversed what we think is going on in some of these caves. And what we think is going on is actually that, that people are telling, the hunters are telling their narratives, their stories about their hunts, complete with the animals they hunted, etc. We were telling stories 40,000 years ago in some form. Now, anthropologists also do ethnographies of what I would call the art market. West African art is no longer simply a tradition. Many of the art objects in West Africa today are made with the intention of being shipped to the United States, and this happens all over the world. Once in the uh, United States, a network of African traders spread the wares throughout the country, and these traders are, live in a f fully in an economic uh, marketplace and not, are not artists themselves. Their interest is in the value of the objects and their ability to sell them to shops and markets across the country. That, uh, this African art is widely copied and produced within the United States, most notably for nationwide chains like Pottery Barn, which exhibits ethnic objects for sale that are in reality mass-produced. So 
what is missing in this this art that is made by non-artists basically and crafted kind of to look like other art and to look older etc is the aura i would argue the loss of animism in the creative hands of an authentic craftsperson the symbolic enlivening power and the direct cultural referent of its cultural meaning the lost in the art in the age of the mecha mechanical reproduction the aura is lost in a sense arguably it's lost because it's not coming from the inner expression of the person reproducing the art in the 1990s there was a lot of questions of, about a faustian contract whether artists were actually uh, producing original art uh, coming from tribal societies and using new media technologies they are in fact using real art producing real art and i say that because they're using sure new forms of media and mediation to produce it what's coming from their inner being right so a really good example of this is the invented tradition of uh of australian art in the 1970s a euro australian art teacher was visiting the aboriginal settlement community of papunya and while the community while visiting the community he became concerned about the high levels of, of unemployment in search of the solution to the problem he started to teach painting to locals they didn't have paints before they used other things other than uh, uh, oil painting encouraging them to paint traditional designs into wooden objects and then to sell them uh, sell the paintings to tourists as a means of a living and this painting style soon took hold in the community and began to be prized in the tourist market Eventually, art dealers from the big cities of Australia began to make special trips to Papunya just to buy this so-called traditional art. While these paintings are not precisely native in origin, the important thing is that they involve traditional symbols and motifs of Aboriginal culture coming from the Aboriginal past, coming from deeply embedded in the Aborig Aboriginal mythology and cosmology. They are produced by Aborigines, thus giving them authenticity on the art market. I'll go to the next slide so you can see that really quickly. Here you can see spirals and stars and some of the motifs that Aboriginals have been using for a long time. Uh, teeth and chains, uh, snakes, and all of the uh, cosmological symbols that represent their origin myths. Of course, there is a relationship between art and power and art and activism. Now, from Elizabeth McAllister's ethnography, she went down and looked at Rara bands in Haiti and uh, looked at the ceremonies that lead up to, led up to Easter Day there. So these bands are made up of members of Haiti's lower class, and they're composed of people who have little political power, and the government and the military in Haiti work closely to maintain firm control over the population. So among the songs they perform are a form of mocking political po political protests called the Poon songs. The Poon songs are one of the f a few ways that the lower class people of Haiti feel they have to speak out against the government. So this is an example of the po public transcript of the hidden transcript of resistance. And if you think about it, uh, this is something we have here. We have political protest songs, certainly in the United States, go st starting in the 1960s. Uh, hip-hop political protest songs from the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, so this is an undeniable force throughout the world. Songs for political power, songs for activism, art for activism. And this is a good time for a quick break. Our specific learning objectives for this lecture at Part 2 Media and Text Reading will be to evaluate the connections and intersections between art and media, to examine the authenticity and aura in the reproduction of culture in artistic terms, to evaluate the potentials and pitfalls of a world of omnivocality. How long have human beings been relating stories about their experience? Well, for a very long time, no doubt. So the flood myth, or the, luge, the deluge myth, is a narrative which, uh, of a great flood, usually sent by a deity or deities to, that destroys a civilization. Often it's in an act of divine retribution. And parallels are drawn between the flood waters of these myths and the primeval waters found in certain creation myths, as the flood waters are described as a measure for the cleansing of humanity. So the flood myth motif is widespread among many cultures as seen in the Mesopotamian flood stories, Hindu religious books from India called the Puranas, the Deucalion and Greek mythology, the Genesis flood myth, and the lore of the Kiche and Maya people, and the Lakor Ojibwa tribe. It's very, very general story. 
So I argue that a widespread myth, this widespread myth, hints at a very enduring oral history tradition. I mean, perhaps even going back as far as the flooding at the end of the Pleistocene into the beginning of the Holocene, about 9700 BCE, the current warming period. Now, remembrances of glacial melting may have spawned these stories that diffused across many continents and regions. And those of us who do research in oral, stel st oral stor storytelling traditions will tell you these uh, oral st storytelling traditions are really uh, long-term, very durable across maybe even millennia, as we've seen evidence for. I have one last great theorist for you, uh, and that is Walter Benjamin, who wrote a great article called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Now, he was writing at the time uh, when Adolf Hitler was chancellor of Germany, and he basically wrote, even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element. It's present in time and space. It's unique existence at the place where it happens to be. He argued that the sphere of authenticity of art is outside the technical, so that the original artwork is independent of the copy, yet though through the act of reproduction, something is taken away from the original, changing its context. Now, he introduced this idea of aura of, of, of work, of artwork, and its absence in reproduction. He wrote that the uniqueness of, art, of a work of art is inseparable from how it is embedded in the fabric of tradition, of cultural tradition. And this speaks to the separation of the original from the reproduction. Now, he was working and writing at, at the time when Nazis were basically changing uh, the, the work of German art at the time, throwing out abstract expressionism completely and really promoting uh, strategically oriented propagandist art. And he was writing against that idea that without the artist writing from his interior soul, right, uh, art as all strategy, as all propaganda was really missing something authentic, something called the aura of from the art. Let me give you a better definition of visual and media anthropology. So visual anthropologists explore the production, circulation, and consumption of visual in images, including photographs, film, television, and new media, focusing on the power of visual representations in art, performance museums, and the mass media in, uh, to influence culture and cultural identity. The visual subject matter of this week's analysis is the subject of visual anthropology, all of it, art and visual field. Now, what I study more particularly is media anthropology, the intersection, I would say, of visual anthropology, that whole field, and mass communications research. So media anthropologists study media cast broadly, the politics of representation. Most of our, us are critical media anthropologists, meaning we interrogate the representation of people, places, and things in human context. Some of us are also applied anthropologists, trying to innovate ways to encourage polyvocality and transparency in global communications while preserving integrity and in reportage of the human condition. I have a couple of last videos that I've, uh, uh, one of them, the uh, first one here I made myself, a sample of Chiapas Media Arts Makers. It's going to take you through a collective called Taller Leñateros, and they're a paper and poster uh, producing collective that makes paper from fig bark paper like they used to do 1300 years ago and they're they're producing really some really sensationalist things one one of the books you'll see is a book called incantations of maya women's poetry uh written uh, only about 20 30 years ago and uh, you also see i also have a video of snazi pahom which is a dramatic arts playwriting and performance collective that have been uh, a group of maya uh, men and women who are, who've been writing plays since the 1980s and 1990s about their own experiences from their ancient Maya past to kind of the social and political issues of today. And you can see a little bit of uh, their performance and a little bit of history of them by going to the YouTube uh, videos. Visual anthropologists also write about culture cast more broadly, cultural identity. In their study, Reading National Geographic, for instance, Catherine Lutz and Jane Collins examined the role of National Geographic, in particular the role of the photographs found on its pages in shaping America's perception of a tribal world. 
and National Geographic's at National Geographic's height, the magazine had 40 million monthly readers, the vast majority of whom were middle class Euro Americans, particularly in the 1950s. National Geographic was the primary way in which middle class Americans learned about the rest of the world. Now, the editors of National Geographic were not interested in working to publish a mere perfect reflection of the world. They published their magazine and the pictures found within it with the particular philosophy in mind. When the magazine was founded, its editors proclaimed that only what is kindly in nature is printed about any country or people. Everything unpleasant or unduly critical is to be avoided. And this gave kind of a pseudo-consciousness, I think, uh, provided pseudo-consciousness about what was going on in the world. You can imagine nothing ugly is being printed in the National Geographic. Now, they never pretended to be a journalistic expose of the dark surfaces of the political intrigue of what America was doing in the 1950s and 50s to the rest of the world. But it also says something about um, the, the impression that we gave our popular culture, our, the citizens of the U.S. during the 50s, of what the rest of the world was doing. And uh, basically, so they, they noted that it gave Americans the impression that f fundamentally all was well in the world, and that the readers in their country played a good and benevolent role in, in the world events. Perhaps it's not fair to call National Geographic deliberately manipulative, but the magazine's popularity and editorial focus left Americans ignorant of struggles and conflicts around the world. Visual anthropologists also can't help but also enter into the world of virtual environments like Tom Brolstorff, who published his first ethnography of a fully virtual digital community. Now, for the previous four years, Brolstorff uh, conducted anthropological research in virtual world of Second Life. I don't know if you guys know about Second Life. It's an immersive online world where people may interact with one another, build virtual homes, attend gatherings and parties, and even buy and sell goods. Participants do all this while negotiating the world as a 3D avatar. So uh, Brolstoff found this community was no less real than non-digital communities. Now we think back to, like here we are again, Benedict Anderson's notion of imagined communities. This is a really influential theory now for two decades at this point. Communities and cultures are formed through the practice of regular social interaction. The members of Second Life interact with one another on a daily basis. And they share the experience of daily life with one another and necessarily result in a community and a culture, etc. 